Okay, well, let's go ahead and get started. We'll allow a few more people to come on in as they as they join. But um, hello, let me officially welcome you on behalf of the California Board of Accountancy. Welcome to our webinar this evening, The Future of the Accounting Profession. We're so glad you've chosen to join us this evening. My name is David Hemphill. I'm on the communications team here at the CBA. I'd like to give you an overview and what we have in store for you this evening and introduce you to the people that will be speaking to you this evening. Our program will begin with three presentations. The first will be given by the president of the California Board of Accountancy, Mr. Michael Savoy. Hello, Michael. Is He'll be talking about the importance of continuing education to maintaining high CPA standards. Following President Savoy will be Sarah Benedict. She's the manager of the CBA's License Renewal and Continuing Competency Unit. And she'll be telling us all about CBA Connect, which is our exciting new online renewal system. Hello, Sarah. Hello. <laughs> the final presentation will be given by Dominic Franzella, the CBA's Chief of Enforcement. And he'll be taking you behind the scenes of the enforcement program for an interesting discussion of its role and how it protects the public. Hello, Dominic. Good evening. <laughs> when the presentations are complete, we'll segue into our panel portion of the evening. We've got four influential members of the accounting community here to discuss where they see the accounting profession is headed and more specifically where the CPA designation is headed. So uh, I'd like to introduce you to our four panelists now. Uh, you've already met our first CBA president, Michael Savoy, CPA. Mr. Savoy is the longest tenured member of the CBA, having served on the board since 2010. This is his third term as president. In his day job, he works as of counsel for BPM, a major accounting and advisory firm. So hello again, President Savoy. Hello. Thank you for allowing me to be here. We are honored to have you. We're also honored to have Denise Fremming, CPA. With us tonight, she is President and CEO of the California Society of CPAs. Welcome, Ms. Fremming. So glad to be here as well. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for joining us. Giving us a national perspective on the topics will be Dan Dustin, CPA, who is the National Association of State Board of Accountancy, NASBA's Vice President of State Board Relations. Thank you for being here, Mr. Dustin. Good evening. Great to be here. We're also excited to welcome Marta Zanievsky to the panel. Ms. Zanievsky serves as Vice President of State Legislative and Regulatory Affairs for the American Institute of CPAs, AICPA, and is also the Executive Director of the Alliance for Responsible Professional Licensing. Glad you're with us. Hi, everyone. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. We've got a good variety of topics lined up for our panelists to discuss, which hopefully you'll find interesting maybe even riveting. We'll see. Our evening will conclude with a question and answer session as time allows. Panelists will be available to take your questions, as will Mr. Franzella and Ms. Benedict from the CBA. I'll let you know when, later in the evening, we'll open up the question and answer feature to accept questions, and you can uh, type them in on your computers. And then the plan is to be all wrapped up right around 7 o'clock. So sit back and enjoy the evening as we dive into the future of the accounting profession. And now to get us started, I will hand it over to CBA President Michael Savoy. Thank you, David, for that warm introduction and good evening to everyone. As David said, my name is Michael Savoy and I serve as president of the California Board of Accountancy or the CBA for short. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. I am pleased that you have chosen to join us and hope you will find our discussions beneficial and informative as we all have a stake in the future of the accounting profession and want to see it continue to prosper in the years ahead. As David mentioned, there will be a panel discussion following the presentations. The panel will touch on topics such as challenges the profession will face in the future, the CBA task force currently deliberating about the experience tracks for licensure, where regulation of the industry may be headed and giving back to the profession. So get ready for some good discussions. I suspect that most of you listening to me this evening are licensed CPAs. So I'd like to thank you all 
for your hard work and dedication to the profession. Public accounting has a long and important history, and the need for our services has never been greater. You are a part of a big uh, economy uh, functioning and the profession hoping to flourish. The mission of the CBA is to protect consumers by ensuring only qualified licensees practice public accountancy in accordance with standards that have been established. That mission is fulfilled in part by the CBA's license renewal process and requirements. Through this process, the CBA ensures that licensees continue to maintain competency in order to practice public accountancy in California. We want consumers to know that they can trust their accounting needs will be met when they choose someone with a CPA designation at the end of their name. Maintaining this trust is how the respect and prestige that comes along with the title is preserved for our future and for the future of CPAs just getting started in the industry. And I hope you agree with me when I say that I enjoy the respect and prestige my career has provided me, and we should all play an active role in maintaining them for the next generation of licensees. This requires CPAs to continue performing quality work, which is aided by possessing an up-to-date knowledge base, which is made possible by the CBA's continuing education requirements for license renewal. To this end, the CBA believes that the specific nature of the CE requirements is very important. From the inclusion of technical and non-technical subjects to the four hours of ethics training, it's all there for a reason, to equip you with the necessary knowledge and skills to remain current and competent in today's professional standards. This is all the more valuable when you consider how the skills of a CPA must possess are currently evolving to encompass today's rapidly changing technology. Tax laws and professional standards are regularly being revised as well. So continuing education plays a crucial role in ensuring licensees maintain or enhance their currency of knowledge to accurately and effectively practice public accountancy for the benefit of California consumers. But continuing education is more than just for the public's benefit. The ongoing pursuit of learning throughout your career also shows a clear commitment to self-development and professionalism and furnishes you with the essential skills that can help you progress further in your career. You have the flexibility to find and incorporate the courses you are interested in, and that will also be useful for your niche in the accounting world. We hope you appreciate the opportunity to personally select the continuing education most beneficial to your unique situation. The CBA has pending regulations that once adopted will add non-learning, blended learning, and adaptive self-study continuing education programs to the already existing programs that the CBA accepts. Additionally, the pending regulations will update the technical continuing education subjects to include business law, economics, management, services, and statistics. The non-technical subject areas will also be updated. A good way to keep updated on when these changes will be implemented will be to follow the CBA on social media. Please know that if you ever have questions about any of the continuing education requirements, the CBA License Renewal and Continuing Competency Unit is always willing to help. And emailing is the best way to reach them. Speaking of license renewal, something we're very excited about at the CBA is our new online system called CBA Connect. Some of you have already and probably already created a CBA Connect account. And maybe you have even renewed your license in this way. Now, here to tell you all the wonderful ways that CBA Connect should make your next license renewal smoother 
is the manager of the license renewal and continuing competency unit, Sarah Benedict. You'll hear more from me during our panel discussions, but until then, take it away, Sarah. Thank you, President Savoy. Good evening. My name is Sarah Benedict and I am the manager of the license renewal and continuing competency unit. I'm here to talk to you about CBA Connect, the CBA's new online renewal platform. In the next few minutes, I'll give you an overview of what you can do inside CBA Connect and tell you why you should create your account today, like right after this event, instead of waiting until your license expiration date. CBA Connect launched in April of this year. Some of you have may already use it to renew your license and the rest of you will definitely be using it soon. Connect has replaced paper applications for CPA renewals. That means that you will not be getting a renewal application in the mail when it's time for your next renewal. You will only receive a reminder that it's time to renew and information on how to access Connect on our website. One of the many ways CBA Connect has improved the renewal process is by providing instant feedback on renewal submission and status and allowing users to print receipts, correspondence, and copies of their completed renewal application. You can also change your address of record at any time in Connect. Another great feature of CBA Connect is how you can use it to track your continuing education. You can start logging your CE immediately once you sign up for a Connect account. That way you'll have it all ready to go when it's time to renew. Okay, let's take CBA Connect for a test drive so you can get familiar with the features and understand how to renew. To get started, visit connect.cba.ca.gov. There is also a link on the homepage of the CBA website that will take you there. I would encourage you to sign up now, not only to start tracking your CE, but also to get familiar with the system before renewal time and for one more good reason. If you sign up for Connect prior to renewal, you will receive notifications from Connect leading up to your renewal. If you are new to Connect, you'll need to click on the Create Account button that you see here. When you enter the information on this page, your date of birth and the last four digits of your social security number must match what's in the CBA database in order for your license to be linked in Connect. Please double check your entries before hitting submit to ensure that they are accurate. The email address that you use to sign up will be your username and you can't change it. We highly recommend that you use a personal email account and not your work email because chances are you are not gonna work there forever. You will receive an email with a temporary password. If you don't see the email, please check your junk or spam folder. If you can, you should mark any emails from CBA Connect as safe senders so you don't miss any messages. There's also a little box for opting out of text messages. If you do not check that box, you will receive a text message every time you get a notification in Connect. It's a great way to ensure that you don't miss any messages that may have gone to your junk folder. There is a great instructional video on the CBA website that walks you through account creation. You can find it under the Licensee tab. Once you've created an account, you will be prompted to enter your license number. If your license number doesn't link for any reason, please contact the CBA for help. Do not try to start over with a new account. This is one of the great parts of CBA Connect. You'll have your own personalized dashboard page. Once your profile is linked, you'll be directed to this page every time you log in. Your license expiration date will be displayed at the top. You can start entering your CE information at any time by clicking on the green Add Continuing Education button. There's no need to wait until you're ready for renewal. When you begin your renewal, any CE that has been entered into CBA Connect will be included in the renewal application. When the time comes and you are within 90 days of your expiration date, a Renew button will appear at the top of your dashboard. It's a really big moment. You are now eligible for renewal and can begin the process by clicking on that button. The renewal does not have to be completed in one sitting. You can start and come back to it later. The continuing education portion of the renewal has a summary option. If you click on the summary button, you will be shown a table with your CE breakdown. I encourage you to utilize this feature to ensure that all of your CE requirements are met prior to submission. You can see that this person did 81 hours total, 
they've got their four hours of ethics, their 40 hours of technical, and they've met their yearly requirements. If all of your CE requirements are met and your application is filled out correctly, you'll be automatically approved. So it's very important to make sure that you've got everything entered correctly. If there is a problem, CBA Connect will ask you to fix it before you proceed. You will see red error messages at the top letting you know what needs to be corrected. If you don't correct it, you'll get a pop-up box letting you know that you're submitting a deficient application. You can skip through it, but if you do that, your application will need staff review and will take longer to process. After the application has been submitted, the Applications box in the dashboard will populate with the application number, submission date, and status. You will also receive an email confirming receipt of the renewal payment and renewal application. As I mentioned earlier, if the application is filled out correctly and the CE requirements have been met properly, the application will be automatically approved within a short period of time, usually within a few hours, if not right away. If an application cannot be automatically approved, it will go to CBA staff for review. You may be contacted by staff and asked to correct a renewal deficiency before your application can be approved. If this occurs, you will receive an email from CBA Connect. This is where the text messages come in handy because you'll get notified right away if there's something that needs your attention. The notifications box on the dashboard will list all the correspondence you have received through CBA Connect. You may click on any entry to read it or print it. You should see your renewal submissions, password changes, and any communication that CBA staff have sent you in this section. In addition to the dashboard, all users have a profile, which is where you'll find a copy of your receipt and where you can change your address. To access your profile, you have to click on the profile on the top left of the page next to your name. Clicking into your profile, you will find receipts in the payment details section. You don't see any here, but after you pay, just click on the view or print link that will appear on the left-hand side of that box. Just above the payment details section, you'll see the mailing address box. To change your address, click on the edit button in the mailing address box. In the bottom left-hand corner is the contact details box. In here, you can change your phone number and email, but please remember, and this is very important, that when you change your email, you're only changing where you receive the correspondence from CBA. You will still need to log in with whatever email you use to sign up with. And that concludes my presentation. I hope you have a better understanding about what CBA Connect is and has to offer, and that you're excited about going and creating your account for those of you who haven't already. If you have any questions about CBA Connect, I'll be around after the panel discussion and can answer them as time allows. And don't forget that CBA staff are always happy to help you. You can reach us by email at renewalinfo at cba.ca.gov or by phone at 916-561-1702. Thank you so much for your attention and I will turn it back over to David Hemphill. Right. Thank you very much for that, Sarah. And don't forget, we will have some questions and answers at the end. So if you had any questions regarding CBA Connect, jot them down now, and we'll open up that question and answer feature uh, a little later when the panel discussion is wrapping up. All right. I would like to uh, turn it over at this point to the CBA Chief of Enforcement uh, position that Mr. Dominic Franzella has held since 2014, going on eight years now. And uh, Dominic, take it away and talk to us about the enforcement program at the CBA. Thank you, David. Uh, so good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today to provide you with some information regarding the CBA's enforcement program. Again, my name is Dominic Franzella, and I am the CBA's Chief of Enforcement. I've had the pleasure to work at the CBA for just over 17 years now, and the last going on eight years overseeing the board's enforcement program. Uh, obviously, the topic of enforcement is one we could spend a great deal of time discussing. However, with the time allotted to me today, I'll focus more on providing information on areas at a, at a higher level. Uh, this evening, I'll, I'd like to provide information on first the functions of the enforcement pro, uh, enforcement, sorry, the functions the enforcement program performs, the purpose and role of enforcement in a regulatory environment, common issues uh, that we see that lead towards enforcement action, including disciplinary action, 
And just some general tips uh, should the enforcement program ever contact you. So beginning first with the functions of the enforcement program. So as you know, the CBA's mission is consumer protection. The enforcement program's primary responsibility is to oversee the enforcement of California laws and rules governing the practice of public accountancy. So in this capacity, the CBA's regulatory influence extends beyond California's borders. The CBA regulates uh, more than 114,000 licensees, including both individuals and accounting firms. And many of these accounting firms have footprints that extend beyond California's borders, both nationally and even worldwide. So some of the functions the enforcement program performs include conducting complex investigations regarding practice issues that would require the uh, expertise of a licensed CPA, conducting investigations for administrative issues and various violations such as continuing education and the completion of peer review, conducting investigations into unlicensed activity, which I know is an important topic for all of you who strive to keep, you know, strive to get the CPA license, maintain the CPA license, um, so that's a, a high priority for this program and for the board. Issuing citations and fines for violations that do not arise to the level of discipline. And then when necessary, filing uh, accusation and imposing discipline uh, when appropriate. And in those certain circumstances, monitoring licensees that are on probation. So as for a purpose and role of enforcement in a regulatory environment, again, we're drawn back to the CBA's uh, mission of consumer protection. Uh, this starts with the foundation, foundational entry level standards for individuals to complete and demonstrate minimum qualification and experience and expertise to obtain licensure. This continues with various requirements related to ensuring licensees maintain or increase their currency and knowledge. Again, these are topics that President Savoy had talked about in his introductory, introductory remarks and also completing peer review for those licensees required to undergo the process. These requirements provide licensees with the information and tools necessary to aid in continued compliance with professional standards, especially in the ever-changing public accounting world. Finally, but just as important lies enforcement. So enforcement is a necessary component to any regulatory framework. When licensees fail to comply with requirements, professional standards, when they're discharging their professional duties, enforcement action may be warranted, oftentimes as a remediation tool, sometimes as a deterrent, and uh, in certain circumstances to remove licensees from the profession as appropriate. Enforcement ensures that the laws and rules established by the legislature and the CBA are adhered to, and as a result, this creates credibility and value to the CPA license, which thereby benefits all of you. So some of the common pitfalls uh, that lead to enforcement action. Um, so when it comes to enforcement action, I think it's an, an important step and uh, important thing to do to take a moment to provide a bit of context as to the types of actions the CBA can take. Uh, in general, the two most common types of actions, uh, the two type, the, the most common types of enforcement actions the CBA takes are the issuance of citations and imposing of infor uh, formal discipline. So citations are generally uh, issued for violations of an administrative type. The most common violations that lead to the issuance of citation include failing to complete the, the minimum yearly continuing education requirement, <clears throat> requirement, what's commonly referred to as the 20 and 12 requirement. But we also see a number of licensees failing to respond to CBA inquiry and also individuals practicing with potentially an expired permit um, or a canceled permit. Uh, when the CBA does issue a citation, it generally has an administrative fine attached to it, and these fines can range from $100 up to $5,000. And as we see uh, coming up lately, that we have a number of individuals uh, who are oftentimes not meeting the minimum yearly requirement on a regular basis, multiple renewals in a row. And as that continues to occur, that administrative fine goes up and up and up. Um, as a means to try to correct the action. So I would suggest that individuals take advantage of the Connect system, log their CE in there at early stages so they know how they're doing from a year-to-year -year, uh, requirement, as well as both from the technical side, but also from the uh, full 20 hours that are needed of each continuing education year. As for formal discipline, this action involves the filing of formal administrative charges against a licensee licensee, which could result in the license being revoked, suspended, disciplined, or otherwise restricted. 
Most common issues we see that lead to discipline include gross and repeated acts of negligence, especially in the area of attestation engagements, and licensees failing to comply with professional standards, again, especially in the area of attestation engagements. The CBA also continues to impose discipline against licensees who have been sanctioned uh, by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the Public Company Accounting Oversight Board, or uh, potentially other state boards of accountancy where they're licensed to practice. So some tips should you be contacted by enforcement. Uh, I hope for all of you that you never have contact with the enforcement program. However, if you are ever contacted by a member of my team, I'd like to provide some tips uh, you can use. So the CBA, uh, so, that, so that the CBA obtains all the necessary facts and information to ensure an efficient process, it is important to fully cooperate with the CBA during the enforcement process. As part of California's rules of professional conduct, uh, all of you are required to be cooperative during the process and not take any action to obstruct any CBA inquiry, investigation, hearing, or proceeding. Licensees are required to respond to requests from the CBA and make available all files, working papers, and other documents. And generally, these responses will be due within 30 days. So I'd encourage you to respond uh, promptly to any requests from the enforcement program. Provide true and accurate responses to questions and documentation when requested. Provide as much documentation as possible to ensure the enforcement staff have a clear understanding of the facts and circumstances. And uh, most importantly, ensure your address of record is current because that's how we make contact with you initially is through the mail. And we need to ensure that we have a current address of record. So uh, in closing, I'd like to thank each of you for taking time out of your day to spend with us. And I hope you have at least a bit of a better understanding regarding the role of the CBA enforcement program. And I'd like to turn it back over to David at this point. All right, thank you, Mr. Frenzel. We appreciate that. Uh, Dominic and I actually sat down recently for a podcast that we recorded. So if you want to hear a little more from him, you can go to the uh, the CBA website, our Accounting for California podcast. President Savoy has an episode on there as well, as does Miss Benedict. There are a lot of stars on there. So that's something we do that you can check out on the CBA website. All right. Well, let's segue into our uh, our panel discussion now at this point and uh, let's get into the, the future of the accounting profession. So I want to just ask them, some of our panelists right out of the gate, why did you decide to become a CPA? And what is a great reason for people today to consider it as a career? And let's go, uh, let's go ladies first. So Ms. Freming, do you want to uh, you want to lead us off on this one? Sure, I'd love to. Thanks, David. So I have a, probably a non-traditional path that I chose, and I think there's probably more of us out there than not. As you talk to individuals, I talked to a new PA as a non-traditional path as well. So I came up through, I'm um, not public, but on the private side, and I wanted to, I was working in finance, I was a senior director of accounting and tax, I wanted to be a CFO, and a recruiter said to me, you have to get your CPA. So I said, okay, because that's what I wanted to do. And um, besides that fact, I knew the CPA, as um, Michael had said before too, um, well-respected, very credible prestige to having the CPA. So that was another um, element that just really rang true with me and what I wanted to do. I would say I'm a big proponent. If any of you see me out, I have I love CPA button that I wear proudly. So um, we're going to have um, Ty, our new chair, has coined the kind of little, little tagline, coolest profession around. So we'll be having buttons. <laughs> and if you're a button person, we'll be having stickers for your water bottles. So it'll be coming out in the next couple months. But um, I do believe it's the coolest profession around. Um, uh, unlimited opportunities. If, as you talk to different CPAs, there's from the forensic side, audit, tax, in the in the private side. So there's there's just so much that you can do. And honestly, you're really at the heart of a lot of business decisions. So for me, I just was able to inform um, decisions that were made. And when you're working on audits or in the tax end, you know everything because you're right at the center. So you can help be that strategic advisor. So um, I can't say enough. I want to give everyone the opportunity to chime in. But for me, I'm just grateful um, that the opportunity was there. And now I'm working with so many CPAs. So for me, it's a it's a dream come true, honestly. So thanks, David. President Savoy. 
Well, growing up back in New York, I was always good in math. So one day my parents said, well, you should be an accountant. I mean, as we know it today, you don't have to be good in math at all because of calculators and computers. But at that time, I really didn't know much about the profession. So in my senior year of high school, I was able to take an accelerated bookkeeping slash accounting class, and I was hooked. Uh, being an accountant, and especially a CPA, is a wonderful springboard to entering a career full of opportunities, both in public and in private industry. If you stay in public, then the pinnacle would do be to become a partner in a CPA firm. Uh, however, if you went into private industry, you could become the CFO, the VP of finance or tax, and even acquiring enough knowledge to run your own company. So, I can only talk about my 49 years as uh, being something very rewarding and something that I would hope everybody would aspire to. Thank you. Mr. Dustin. It's kind of interesting listening to President Savoy and, and Denise talk about their backgrounds and mine's kind of a mix of the two. I uh, actually was in college and I was an engineering student for about two and a half years. And it came to be a decision point where I said, this just isn't working the way it needed to. And, and ultimately I looked to uh, the School of Business and I, I looked at the various majors that were there at the time. And I knew marketing wasn't something I wanted to do and management just seemed like it was too generic. And, and I started spending some time uh, in accounting. And uh, you know, number one, it was known to be a challenge for those who were in the business school. Not everybody wanted to be up to that challenge. Uh, it had a reputation for, you know, a, a tough licensure exam. And, and so, you know, going to school, going back to some to a community college to take some additional courses uh, and going back to that school to ultimately graduate uh, and, and become a, a CPA was like a, a, really a dream come true in a way. And, uh, you know, I started out in public accounting. Uh, went into state government uh, for a few years and ultimately now work in, in private industry So, in, for an association. So for me, uh, being a CPA just opens the doors in many ways. Uh, it's constantly evolving. It's never the same. Uh, and it's a tremendous opportunity for anybody who gets involved in the profession. All right, thank you. So let's get out our crystal balls now and look ahead five to 10 years. So what, what would you say is the biggest challenge that the, uh, the coolest profession around is going to face, I'm stealing that, uh, for the next five to 10 years? President Savoy, why don't you lead us off on this? What do you think, biggest challenge coming down the well, line? Well, I mean, right now, there is a big need to fill the next generation of CPAs. And whether this comes from younger people entering the profession, or even a career change for professionals in other occupations, society still needs trustworthy individuals that they can count on to provide accurate financial uh, services and advice. But technology will continue to play a large role in the profession going forward. We're able to do so much more faster and with less staff through technology. I also see the CPA of the future having more international accounting knowledge because more companies we work with, both large and small, are doing business internationally. Ms. Anievsky. I think for uh, the CPA profession and um, as the only, I think, non-CPA on this panel, I just play one on TV. I think for, from my perspective, you know, I think relevancy of the profession is a big um, issue moving forward. And what I mean by relevancy is there are, the market's changing, the customer's changing, the client is changing, and the needs uh, to President Savoy's opening remarks are constantly changing. And I think as the profession, we need to continue to stay relevant in our clients' lives in how we serve the public. And that comes with a lot of expertise and time 
and guidance. And I think we will rise to the challenge of staying relevant and providing a very much needed service. Mr. Dustin. It's, it's pretty interesting to, you know, look at the demographics of what's happening, uh, you know, in our country right now and really around the world. For us, the demographics are astounding that the baby boomer generation is retiring and, and you know, massive numbers at this point. And yet at the same time, we're facing really a pinnacle in, in high school graduates coming up in 2026, 2027. And, and what that means, it's going to be a challenge for us. Uh, to attract and retain uh, students to enter the profession. So I think that's really going to be something that's going to represent greater competition, uh, not only uh, amongst the licensed professions, if you're talking about engineering, accountancy, uh, you know, medicine, whatever it is, but also the occupations. There's just going to be a smaller population of people entering the workforce, which means we're going to have to be ready for that. And that's why I really love that tagline, Denise, that you have, because hopefully we can change the mindset of what accounting is all about. Continue, Ms. Fremming. Go ahead. I would just say, you know, from a diversity, equity, and inclusion, I'm going to kind of go down that path, but it's just making sure that we have a profession that is diverse, equitable, and in inclusive, because that's going to be um, what will help us from an innovation standpoint and from just having different voices, different perspectives to make some of these changes, because it's tough. The pace of change is tough. You know, all the panelists talked about the complexity and in order to make sure that we can address that, we're going to have to have the brightest minds around and make sure we're all focused um, and aligned. And I, I just think sometimes there's statistics out there that people are leaving. They aren't feeling included. They aren't feeling that they have a place. And so they're leaving the profession. And we don't want that because it's hard enough to attract, but it, we want to make sure we retain. So we have to make sure we have, um, you know, parameters and just um, programs in place to make sure that people feel included. Absolutely. Good. Well, there's some good, good issues kind of out there to deal with. Let's expand a couple of you mentioned about how, uh, Perhaps there are not, and there's been studies to this, that there aren't as many uh, young people in the uh, degree programs and then coming into the, the CPA title. What would you say, why is that so important for those of us, the current licensees uh, already working in the profession? Do you wanna, do you wanna continue, Ms. Fremen? Sure, I can start off. Um, from the perspective, I, I'll just start out with succession planning to make sure that there is a robust um, workforce because if you want to retire or if you're a partner and you want to sell your firm or from that perspective, you need to make sure that you have a workforce that is um, credible and that you have the skills that you need. So from just that perspective, from succession planning, it's important that um, we have a robust workforce. I'll let someone else take it down another angle. All right. Mr. Dustin? You know, I, I looked at it how the way accounting is really unique amongst the professions in that we have that reserve service. Only CPAs can sign an audit report. And you look at the impact we have on the public or on the consumer uh, from the work we do. You look at our impact on governments, local, state and local governments, even the federal government, pension plans, not-for-profits, banks, and financial institutions. And the list goes on and on. And, and so for me, you know, it's, it's things that we do that no one else can do and, and somehow we have to find that next generation that's going to maintain the strength and relevancy of our profession. And, and certainly most importantly, you know, look toward uh, consumer and public protection. Ms. Anievsky. I think just to build off of what Dan just said, you know, we, we often hear about the infrastructure of our country. And I think there's the financial infrastructure of our country. That is so very important that I think to Dan's point, the general public doesn't understand all that this profession does. And so I think the, the pipeline issue, the recruiting folks to become licensed, I think that is integral to the financial infrastructure of not only this country, but to our communities, to our cities, um, to our schools, to wherever you go, 
uh, to worship. I think that is something that is often over not seen. And I think that plays an integral role in the social construct of this country. And that license really, um, and I can talk about licensing for hours. So I'm glad you're going to cut me off eventually, David. But that license, that CPA license is the social contract that CPAs have with the public. And that is something that, and I, I work within my role at AICPA across all jurisdictions. And that license is really so important. And that's why I think it is it's so important to then make sure people enter the profession and enter into that social contract with the public, because that is the number one accountable way for CPAs to provide a very important service to their clients. And so I think if that entire process is not kept up, um, our country will suffer for it. I really, I really do believe that. And President Savoy, I know you're trying to help the issue as as your children have gone into the profession. <laughs> well, I mean, pretty much with the number of people entering the profession flattening today, I mean, the CPA pipeline is a major issue. Not having enough professionals to do audits and tax work will certainly have an immediate impact on our profession. I know that Cal CPA and the CBA are working collectively uh, to help support pipeline initiatives. We're also working with NASBA and trying to pull it all together because none of us want to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we want to work collectively and collaboratively to come up with solutions, whether it's high school and attacking it at that level, because most kids that go into college pretty much already know what they want to do. So I think we need to attack it a little bit sooner. Uh, the CBA has also played a pretty big role by streamlining <clears throat> and adding some flexibility to licensure process. And this is not just an issue in California. So both nationally and statewide agencies are really collaborating to come to some type of joint effort to see where we can go with this. That's good. And just the simple fact that the spotlight is starting to get shined on this issue uh, will hopefully lead to better results down the road. All right. Thank you, all of you, for, for those. Uh, now, each of you are very involved in the profession, of course. You've volunteered on many boards and committees over the years. So I thought this might be kind of fun. What was the most rewarding experience you had giving back in the profession? And uh, would you recommend those watching us tonight to do the same? Let's start with you, Mr. Dustin. This, this was a really interesting one to, to really consider, uh, you know, what is that one thing? And, and I have to think back to my time working with the New York State Board of Public Accountancy. I was the executive secretary there uh, for a number of years. And it was having the opportunity to go on campus and, and speak with students uh, and, and really, you know, feel their energy, uh, you know, their excitement about possibly becoming a CPA. So it was really an enjoyable opportunity to go out and, and really meet the students and, and really encourage them along the pathway. And, and I guess I would suggest to the folks that are here that if you're not involved, to get involved in some way. Certainly there are folks who participate uh, on, you know, accounting program, uh, advisory boards or committees. But, but certainly some of the things we've talked about uh, with the CP Evolution Initiative and, and other things is, is just the fact that trying to connect individuals and firms with folks who are in the academic community, uh, the academic community students really benefit if they have that real life experience in the classroom. If it's even just coming in and spending one session talking about what you do or how you do it. I think it really in, in, in enhances an understanding of the profession and really gains that excitement. So I think it, it really positively has a positive impact on, on the profession as we move forward. Ms. Fremming, yeah? Sorry, I didn't, didn't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, no, I had to go back to and, and think about um, just an experience and because there's so many, I think there's so many, but you always get more than you um, 
and you give. I think always when you have opportunities to volunteer and mine is from a mentoring standpoint, but I've had the opportunity to mentor a number of young professionals and seeing them um, move into leadership positions and just blossom and being able to inspire them. Um, and they inspire me then back. And it's like I said, it's, it's much more than, than I give is to me, I think from a mentoring standpoint, so important. And I would encourage all the young professionals out there, those that are five years out, six years out of getting their license to go back and, and go to those students because they want to hear from you. They don't necessarily want to hear from me, but they want to hear from all of you. So go back and, um, share your experiences, share what you've learned and um, what the profession has to offer. It's, it's really important. And at Cal CPA, we want to work with the young professionals. We have uh, young professionals, emerging professionals group with all the chapters at the state level. So if you want to be involved, I mean, reach out. We will never turn anyone away because um, we want to hear your voice and you can help shape policies, you can help shape the industry because we need real world examples. So I would encourage you all to um, reach out to any of us and ask us how to get involved. We can connect you in any way you want. Great. President Savoy. For me, that's an easy one. Uh, it would be serving on the California Board of Accountancy for the last 12 years. I mean, being on the board for as long as I have, has given me a tremendous insight as to how things really happen in California. From proposing a solution to a particular situation to the enactment of a law and then to effectuate that change. I've met some incredible people through my community involvement. I've learned from them and I've also imparted some of my knowledge to them. I've made lifelong friends, business resources and clients. But the key is to get involved to help move things forward in your community. It is important to find out where you fit and how you want to make a difference. And I just want to say thank you, Michael, for your commitment, dedication. We appreciate it. Excellent. Yes, definitely. Ms. Zanievsky. I think for me, one of the most rewarding um, experiences is I, I am a daily advocate for this profession, and I am so happy that I get to have this job every day. And I, one of the biggest rewards for me was uh, I was meeting with uh, others and legislators about a bill in a state, and we were in the chambers with some legislators, and the legislator looked and said, I just want to hear from the CPAs. I want to hear what the CPAs think about this. And that reputation goes across many jurisdictions. And that was a very um, humbling moment, um, but I gave him all of my thoughts, so he got those. And it's very much a, a plug, I think, and Denise, if I may, to get involved with um, Cal CPA and advocate for the profession um, and educate folks on the value of the profession and the roles you play in your communities and with your clients. Um, I think we don't advocate enough for ourselves. So when there is an opportunity, um, I hope you all take it and get involved with the society because I know Denise and her staff run a great program of how we can educate all of those lawmakers in California on all the great things that you do. We should give a plug for Jason, <laughs> Jason Fox, because yes. it's great. I know he's listening and um, just does a wonderful job with his team on advocating for the profession. Always Absolutely. there and um, top of mind for everything he does. Absolutely. So many ways to get involved. Uh, all very rewarding. And since we're giving plugs, I'll plug that. Uh, CBA does have some openings on some of its advisory committees right now as well. If someone is feeling extraordinarily inspired right now, you can go to the CBA website on uh, under the quick hits. There's a section right there that says opportunities to serve. So if you feel so moved, there we go. We're always looking for good qualified individuals for that. Right now, the CBA has a task force looking into whether to continue offering two experience tracks for CPA licensure one with the test authority and the other with 
uh, the general experience. So I want to know why is this an important topic to be discussing? And we'll start this one with you, President Savoy. Well, you know, California is one of very few states remaining that still allows two different experience tracks for licensure. And I felt it was time to dig in and determine whether this is still the course we should take in California. The CBA established the consideration of the CPA Experience Requirement Task Force, better known as CERT, earlier this year, and the first two meetings have resulted in a good deal of productive dialogue on that topic. With the various voices representing this task force, we can weigh the pros and cons of any next steps effectively with input on how they would affect the many licenses that we have serving uh, and clients in a magnitude of different ways. While the task force is being conscious of the pipeline issues and the need to have quality candidates entering the field without unnecessary barriers, they are also considering the crucial importance of the attest experience requirement and the qualifications necessary to sign reports on attest engagements. And as a matter of fact, one of the task force members is on this panel. Dan, just add a few things to, without being specific as to what we're doing, but how is it going? Well, President Savoy, first I have to thank you for uh, asking me to serve on this task force. Uh, a lot of wonderful people are on that task force with you know various views on the topic. And, and I think that just lends itself to the great dis discussions that have been going on. And, and certainly, you know, my hat off to the, the staff at CBA because they've done a wealth of research, provide us a lot of background information to look through. Uh, certainly, this isn't a new topic. It's been a topic that's been talked about periodically over time. And, and I think it is a very important topic. Uh, you know, certainly, as you pointed out, uh, California is fairly unique in its approach to having two different levels of experience for licensure. Uh, and at the same time, we have mobility uh, of CPAs practicing around the country uh, under mo a mobility provision where they don't necessarily need to be licensed in every jurisdiction. So there are certainly concepts out there to be considered. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, I, again, the, the task force will be meeting in the next few weeks again and uh, continue to look uh, to the very valuable uh, deliberations that have been taking place. Ms. Zanievsky? Another chance to speak on licensing for you. Thank you. Uh, I think, um, you know, I see uh, as from the AICP perspective, I see various jurisdictions hold many conversations and a test is, um, I think, one of those issues that comes up in various states. And I think it's, it's a necessary conversation, you know, as the CBA uh, has to protect the consumers in your state, those conversations should occur to figure out what serves the public best in California. At the same time, the, uh, the profession is very lucky to have the Uniform Accountancy Act um, that many, and it's getting now very nerdy, so I apologize, but the Uniform Accountancy Act is a model law and regulations that the profession, uh, the AICP and NASBA work on together. Uh, we are now on our eighth edition, and it is a model that not many have. Many occupations do not have a uniform model that they turn to, and we are lucky that we do. And the UAA um, has guidance and language um, on a test and on experience um, that many jurisdictions have adopted. And so I think that's something to keep in mind as these conversations continue as well. Ms. Brennan? I just wanted to thank and commend you know, Michael and the uh, CBA CBA for just asking the question why I think we, we need to do that, especially after 2 years of a pandemic, right? We need to step back and say, why are we doing this? So thank you and thank you for including some of our members past chairs. Um, appreciate the opportunity to get involved and for you all to just the way you're approaching it from having different perspectives. Um, it's just beneficial to the to the profession. So thank you. A good segue from what you were just kind of discussing, uh, Ms. Zanievsky, I'll pose this one to you to start. Uh, how important is it 
for states to have oversight and to regulate the accounting profession. And then how do you see that regulation? Do you see it increasing or decreasing in the years ahead? Um, this is my favorite question, so thank you. I think it is very important to um, have regulatory oversight over certified public accountants. Um, I think that there is, of course, um, a fine line and there's also um, reasonable regulation. And I think the accounting profession has very much hit its stride on what is reasonable regulation, while, of course, helping the profession practice, um, not creating barriers to practice, and at the same time, protecting the public. And that is a very fine dance, but I think we do it very well. And I think in partnership with NASBA and with the AICPA, um, we are able to hopefully um, help with that dance and um, promote reasonable regulation. In regards to your second question, um, you know, <laughs> from my perspective, it depends on the jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions don't want any regulations, um, and some regulate some um, states. And believe it or not, think that Yelp reviews are the way to go of hiring professionals. Um, that's not the way to go. Uh, reasonable regulation, boards of accountancy, standards, ethics um, are the way to ensure public protection. And so I don't think the regulations are going to go away. Um, and I think the it's always ebbs and flows um, around the country of where regulations land. Um, but I think the public time and time again um, we have within um, the CPA profession, a coalition where we work with architects and engineers, and we have um, surveyed the public time and time again about how they see this profession and those professions I just mentioned. And the public overwhelmingly wants that license. The public sees the value of the license and of regulations. And so I think they're here to stay. And I'm very happy to know that they are because the services that the CPAs provide absolutely um, have huge consequence on the public. That must be fascinating viewing it state by state and just the differences uh, between each. Um, President Savoy, do you want to chime in as far as specifically California, where you see them going? Yeah, I mean, as CPAs take on engagements that require a higher degree of technological sophistication, regulators like the CBA need to keep up with those innovations and how they intersect with professional standards. California statutes and regulations regarding the practice of public accounting hasn't really changed that much in this area, but we may see new standards emerge in years to come just because it's needed. Ms. Fremming? I would just piggyback on what Michael said in this. As the world becomes more complex, I think we're seeing that. Um, there's just going to need to be regulations put in place to have some of those safeguards. And I think we saw it with PPP that came out and there's just was no one knew what to do. And so there had to be um, regulations and safeguards put in place. So I, I just think as there's more uncertainty and as things unfold and the pace of change is what it is, there'll just be more regulation to kind of make sure there's those those safeguards in place. And Mr. Dustin, do you want to give us uh, a national perspective a little bit again? Sure. It's kind of interesting, and I, and I agree with Marta that you know it, it varies jurisdiction to jurisdiction at the at the state level, and certainly we all strive for reasonable regulation. For me, I, I step back in time. I, I got involved with the New York Board of Accountancy in the late 90s. And frankly, it was right before Enron and WorldCom. And I can remember when that happened in 2002, 2003, whatever the time frame was, there was just like this rush to judgment at both at the, the state and the federal level to come up with all types of regulation to control accountancy. Yet it really wasn't the accountants that did the bad things. It was the publicly traded companies. And, and I can remember sitting, you know, at, at, uh, in, a, in a meeting with the Securities and Exchange Commission because New York had a number of publicly traded companies. And they wanted to know, well, what is it that you can do to improve 
the practice of the profession. And unfortunately, you know, regulators are looked on as, as if, you know, we can control what everybody does. And I, I think when you go back to that reasonable regulation, it, it's knowing that you have to regulate 100% of the population, but really you're focusing on, as Dominic probably does, focuses on that one or 2% of the bad actors that are out there. And unfortunately, those bad actors are the ones that are reflective of our profession. So, you know, I, I think, you know, as Marta says, ebbs and flows, I, I talked about it as tide, the tide comes in, the tide goes out, and it changes over time, or it's like the pendulum on a clock. You know, it's either high or it's low, and it depends on really who's in charge and what's happening at any given point in time. And, and right now, uh, I think we're in a, a, a good spot with respect to the regulation. Uh, but again, you know, Marta can go on also about the anti-regulatory environment that, that we're facing today that could really bring that to change if we're not all real careful about what's going on. So let's talk broader uh, for a moment. What advice would you give to our viewers? Uh, many of them are already in the coolest profession around, CPAs, and about how to find the most success as a CPA. Uh, Ms. Fremming, do you want to start on this one? Sure. I'm going to build on what Michael, again, Michael, what you had said at the beginning of the program is really continuous learning. So we know that um, there's, as Marta would say, new frontiers out there as far as new opportunities for firms and um, ESGB, one of those. But um, we know that different skills will be needed going forward from a technology perspective. And so I would say just continuous learning. That's going to be the norm. That's the norm in, I think, a lot of professions, but definitely for this one as the CP evolution is keying in different um, skill sets and competencies. Just would say you have to continue continually learn and lean into technology um, because it's not going away. And it can help augment what you do and make your life even more interesting um, because it'll do the work that you don't want to do and you can um, do more of the analytical work. Ms. Anievsky? I would say um, embrace your entrepreneurial spirit. Um, I think uh, that CPA license really gives you that entrepreneurial uh, license to do whatever you want to do. And I think as CPAs, and I sort of how we began this conversation, you, the, you can do whatever you like. And I think as Denise pointed out, you know, we have crypto, we have new technologies, we have the cannabis space. Um, you know, I heard a CPA tell me a story the other day that he was couple of years ago at a bank in Denver, Colorado, and he saw a guy with four backpacks full of cash. And he was like, what are you doing? Who, who, are you going to go to jail? Is anyone counting this money? Do you know what you're doing? And he was able to help this man. And now he has a booming business and he credits his CPA for getting him in order and having a good business mind. So I think embrace the entrepreneurial spirit, see where you can use your talents and use that license for that social contract, as I mentioned, to establish the confidence within the people that you're gonna work with. Great advice. Mr. Dustin. My thoughts were sort of along the same line. It's, it's really find what interests you the most and, and certainly develop an expertise because certainly the public relies on CPAs for that expertise. And then to go back to what Denise said, stay current, whether it's continuing education or through training, whatever it is, uh, maintain that. And, and certainly, I, I think the other thing is, is to value your client relationships. Uh, certainly, we are the trusted profession. And, and so that is, is key to what we are and, and who we are. And President Savoy? Well, certainly my views is certainly uh, a little more holistic. Uh, we all know there's a shortage of good accountants in our profession. So you all are making a great career choice. Be confident, work hard, because the ability to earn more and move quickly within an organization is totally dictated by your own ability and work ethic. If you are good at what you do and work hard, you'll be provided 
with longevity in your career and an abundance of opportunities to find work within. Okay. I'm going to turn the uh, question and answer feature on now as we get set to wrap up this portion of the panel discussion. So if you're out there and you have questions for any of our panelists or their CBA um, staff members, Ms. Benedict or Mr. Franzella, you can go ahead and start entering those into the Q&A and we'll try to get to a few of those. As we wrap up, let's kind of finish off um, by, again, just kind of looking ahead and what trends are out there um, that are kind of interesting to you that you're noticing, whether it's uh, locally or at the California level or, or nationally in regards to the accounting profession that might be of some interest to all of us. Uh, Mr. Dustin, you want to start there? I, I think we touched on several of them today. Certainly, the pipeline is, is key. There's a lot of work among the various stakeholders with respect to pipeline right now, whether it's the, the associations, whether it's AICPA or NASPA, firms, uh, state societies, a lot of work being done in that area, trying to define what it is we need to do. Certainly changes to the CPA examination that are gonna occur in, in 2024 uh, are gonna have a significant impact on, on, on the profession going forward. Uh, we, we mentioned technology and, and certainly technology is, is having an impact because uh, those, you know, entry level positions that, that the tasks that I was doing when I entered the profession of ticking and tying a uh, handwritten 13 column paper does not exist anymore. And, uh, you know, I, I might have a pad or two in a closet here somewhere. I'm, I'm looking at President Savoy and he's agreeing, I think, but, uh, uh, you know, certainly Technology is going to change and it's going to continue to change the way we're practicing. And uh, finally, I, I think really it's 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 the regulatory environment we're in as well. So there's there's a several different things going on and they're all equally important to the profession right now. Ms. Anievsky. Uh, the, the space that I'm very excited about and that California actually has taken the lead on is the environmental social and governance area, uh, ESG, uh, regarding climate, climate change, um, and the work that companies um, will do in this space. And I think from a fiduciary responsibility, uh, CPAs have a very natural fit into that kind of work and what that entails and helping companies meet various um, climate and gas emission standards um, set by whether it's the um, SEC, um, the UN, or other bodies that um, we have committed to meet. And I think that's a very exciting space for the profession moving forward. Ms. Fremen. And um, what I see exciting is um, kind of ele elevating the, the CPA from a, you know, we talk trusted advisor, but business advisor, strategic advisor, but really being critical, as I said when I started, to the whole business decisions and being at the center of, of everything. And, you know, as Marta said, too, on the ESG, there's just so many more opportunities, new frontiers, as we said, because the, the analytical lens that a CPA has allows that to not them to not just look at the financial piece, but at other elements because they have that training and that um, analytical piece. So I, I just think there's so much opportunity out there um, now and as we go forward. Great, thank you for that. Uh, so Ben wrote in and asked the question, how transferable is your CPA across the nation? That's a good question. Does someone wanna jump in on that? Maybe Ms. Fremming, you wanna start then? Actually, I'll punt it to Marta because I think Marta is, is a picture for everything. I think it's pretty transferable, but I'm, she has all the, the nuts and bolts of that. Yes, thank you, Denise. And, and Dan, please jump in because you and I work on this every day. Um, a very short answer, very transferable. Um, the profession decades ago ensured that CPAs um, are able to travel from state to state as clients need them. And so we um, enjoy uh, a very good mobility model that um, works in 55 jurisdictions across the country. And Dan, I don't know if you want to add more from a NASBA perspective on that. Yeah, I, I would only 
add Marta to the side where somebody decides to move to another state and seeks licensure. And, and by the same token, uh, the boards of accountancy have reciprocity provisions in, in their statutes and rules that if you generally have four years of experience in the last 10 years, it's an expedited process to licensure in that other state. So uh, again, I think the accountancy profession has uh, really dealt with some of these issues uh, fairly well. Okay, Julia asked, uh, is there a plan to sunset the two track CBA credential? And that's that's what we were talking about earlier, uh, Julia. That's what the CERT task force is looking at right now. So there's no plan either way there. They are discussing that. The next meeting of that task force will be in September, uh, I believe the 15th, uh, if you want to follow along uh, how things go at that meeting. Uh, Tania, I believe, I hope I said your name correctly, uh, asked, what has been the most valuable aspect of working with the CBA as a volunteer? So maybe President Savoy, you can take that most valuable aspect. And you've been doing I, it a long time. I mean, it's the amazing people that you meet along the way. Having been on the board for 12 years, you can imagine how many board members have come and gone in my tenure. But the friendships, the relationships, uh, how smart people are that you work with. But the biggest takeaway is the 100 person CBA staff that does the daily grunt work that enables the board to operate in a really efficient manner. My, my hat goes off to the board, uh, the executive officer, Patty Bowers, and the work she's done and assembled an incredible staff uh, that makes my life, at least over the last 12 years, uh, much more enjoyable. Uh, Richard asked if we're gonna provide a, um document or anything like this. We we are recording the event, so we are going to put that up on the CBA website shortly after, as soon as we can get that posted. Uh, Jeff says, with the cost of higher education increasing more and more, has thought been given to reducing required college credits from 150, but keeping the same specific class requirements? In my firm, many applicants are filling credits with non-business units to be CPA eligible, so the value added is questionable in more recent cases. So that's an interesting one. President Savoy? Uh, you know, it took a long way uh, to get to the 150-hour requirement with all 55 jurisdictions. I'm not sure if it's all 55 have acknowledged it or just 54 at this point, but... Um, I don't see that happening, but what you what you should keep in mind is that you do not need uh, the 150 hours to actually take the CPA exam. 120 and a baccalaureate degree will allow you to take the exam. And then through your firm or a master's in tax while you're working, most firms will uh, subsidize and or pay for that master's you can achieve those final 30 hours to get to the 150. But at this point, I do not see that going uh, backwards. Ms. Benedict, we have a question for you from Rob. He says, will the CBA Connect continuing education records synchronize with Cal CPA's continuing education tracker records? Thank you, David. Um, the answer to that question is kind of. So they're not going to work seamlessly where it goes from one system to the other, but we have been working very closely with Cal CPA, and what we believe is going to be um, available in the future is an Excel document that licensees can obtain from Cal CPA, and they can go to Connect and upload it, and it will just take everything from Cal CPA and put it into Connect for them. That's still in the works, so more details to come, but we are working closely to work something out for Cal CPA members. Thank you, Ms. Benedict. All right, we have a, uh, well, look at this. We have a celebrity question ask, asker. I believe this is uh, Mr. Rosenbaum, who is a CBA member. He uh, asks, as technology advances, will the number of necessary CPAs decrease? So, 
I'll throw it out to whoever wants to jump in on that. I mean, I can start. I don't know that the number will necessarily decrease, but I think the work will change as far as what's being done. Um, I think there's plenty of work out there and the work will increase as we go into new areas, but the, um, the work will change. And I think that's good news because some of the routine work that um, technology can uh, assume doesn't doesn't have to be done by one of us. And so the um, we can move into higher levels analytical work that is probably much more interesting to everyone than um, you know what we used to do with the ledgers and some of that ticking in time. Mike asked a question. Oh continue if someone else has I'm just waiting for disagreement or rebuttals. <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> getting ready. Going once, going twice. So Mike says, um, based on our discussions from earlier, how can we recruit more high school students at scale to help with the talent crunch? That's good. Sounds like Mike wants to get involved and, and help in on that. So he wants to jump in on that. And I can jump in first and then just because we're this is near and dear to us and we're we're working on this initiative going into high schools and middle schools as well, because that's where decisions are being made um, even earlier now. So we're working on partnering with other organizations and not going in necessarily um, as one or two individuals, but working with um, the boys club or the girls club or Girl Scouts or um, DECA. How can we go in with other organizations that have a foothold already and um, elevate and have an entree that is much more impactful than just how we've been doing it really through financial literacy. So we're working on strategic partnerships to help advance and um, enhance kind of our initiative in that space. And if you want to be involved, see me. I will find a place for you. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? So we have uh, CD, I believe, says any thoughts? This is mo more of a general, uh, maybe mental health almost question. Any thoughts or comments on workload compression? Like, and I like this suggestion, like moving April 15th to a later date. <laughs> Not sure how possible that is. Or better workload management. Of course, the crunch of tax time. Those of you who have been in the trenches, any uh, workload management tips for our viewers? You know, I mean, our schedules, for the most part, are dictated by the government. Uh, so, you know, us as jurisdictions can only reach out, uh, as we did years ago, and change some of the October filing dates to September to give us an extra 30 days to actually work on, you know, individual returns and not wait for partnership returns. So uh, I can't, as long as there's tax, driving our economy and the deadlines that it imposes the 15th day of every month. Uh, I can't see that happening. But one thing I will mention, and it's very prevalent at our firm, is with telecommuting now. I mean, people are working from home and not even coming to offices. I believe at our firm, we have employees in 37 different states. Uh, five years ago, this was unheard of. The pandemic actually forced a lot of this to happen, and a lot of firms are embracing it. Uh, it's not too good for the real estate market, but uh, <laughs> and more to buildings aren't necessary too much anymore to house employees. But that seems to be a trend that I think people can hire more people that do not have to come in. Travel is not an issue. Traveling an hour, two hours to get your office, wake up, you're at your desk. So I think that alone will invite future candidates to come into our profession and, and could keep us going. I would say I've been hearing from a number of firms too, there are much more flexible um, frameworks and approaches for working and allowing, you know, work in the morning or afternoon or whatever works for you and having time in between for kind of that mental health so that they've been trying different models. Some of them are 
are not even a 40 hour work week. They're doing a 30 hour doing something that is is um, shared. So there's a lot of different pilots and models that are being tried out there to really help with that um, compression and some of the um, stress that is at certain times of the year. Ms. Benedict, I've got a, a couple of questions for you here. I'll just ask them at the same time. Uh, Jamie says, based on the panel discussion, are you planning on any changes in the uh, continuing education requirements in any areas? And then Rita says, in license renewal, currently the online renewal system only accepts CE credits in uh, you know zero or half hour increments. However, there are companies who offer incremental CE uh, with 0.4 increments, which will be lost if added to the online system. So is that, speak to that. Thank you, David. <laughs> uh, the CBA does have a regulations package that we're working on right now that would allow for nano and blended courses. It also adds a couple of different um, subject areas that could be considered technical and non-technical. So there's nothing that's being more restrictive but we're opening it up to allow for more classes to be acceptable for CPE. And speaking to the uh, half hour credit, the CBA regulations currently state that courses have to be in half hour increments. There are lots of uh, companies like Ernst & Young that are nationwide and other states might offer nano and that might be why they're offering um, you know, smaller increments, but the CBA does not allow it at this time However, when that regulations package goes through, we will be uh, um, accepting those increments. So you wouldn't lose your 0.4 or your 0.3 um, once that's in place. All right, so uh, Mr. Franzella, I do have a, I think you can handle this one. Um, Back in the day, I was under the impression that only CPAs could advertise as accountants and that unlicensed accountants had to call themselves bookkeepers. Is that still true? So the term accountant and some of the accounting, some of those are uh, somewhat of a restricted uh, title to the CPA with some uh, flexibility, though, there was a Supreme Court case many, many years ago called Bonnie Moore, where the term accountant was allowed to be more, uh, allowed non-licensees to use that term, depending on the services that they were uh, rendering, provided that they clearly told consumers that the services that they were performing didn't require licensure. So uh, we get a number of complaints over the years uh, related to unlicensed practice, the use of that term and we work with those individuals to bring them into compliance with that body more case by putting that disclaimer out there. So they do have more flexibility to use it, but they have to do it in such a way that a consumer would not. Thank you, Mr. Franzella. So this is an interesting one kind of going the other direction. Uh, Catherine says, thank you for taking time to discuss all of this. My question is, how do we deal with the older people still in the profession that are not capable of keeping up with technology? That's part of why we are losing younger generation Z candidates. We have some thoughts on that. Just hope they all retire. No, I don't. I'll, I'll I'll suggest something. Um, <laughs> there is reverse mentoring. So there is benefit to having, I mean, I, my son helps me. So um, there is benefit to having a younger person mentor more seasoned individuals and much value to that. So um, it goes back and forth and I know it's successful in some organizations. So I'm gonna put out that out there as a opportunity for all. Excellent. All right. Well, I want to say thank you for uh, for all of the great questions. Um, Ms. Benedict wanted to, uh, if you have any specific questions, remind you about CBA Connect, renewal info at cba.ca.gov. Another way to uh, just to kind of contact the CBA uh, and our outreach department in general, uh, the email address is outreach 
at cba.ca.gov. So do you, if you have any other questions that were maybe spurred from our conversations this evening that were not able to be answered, feel free to ask them through there and we will uh, respond to those as we can. Like I said, we did record this, so we'll have a recording up uh, on the website very, very soon. Uh, panelists, I want to thank you all so very much for sharing so much, many, many years of, of expertise between the four of you. Thank you for doing all the good work and uh, fighting for our profession and the coolest profession around. I, I want to see. We should all wear those buttons next time we're here. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Benedict and uh, Mr. Franzella from the CBA for letting us know a lot of the, the stuff happening at the CBA. And Thank you to all of you for taking the time out of your Monday evening to uh, to watch this. We hope it was informative and you got a lot out of it. And again, we appreciate all you're doing for our industry and keep up the great work. All right. Have a great rest of your evening, everyone. From all of us at the California Board of Accountancy, thank you again for being a part of this evening. And we wish you a good night. <laughs>